believe the uh, the bongos were your first musical instrument uh, you were involved with. Is that right? Yeah, I kind of started fooling around with them when that was a joke. So they never got too serious? Uh, not professionally or anything like the guitar. Do you remember your first guitar? Uh, oh, yeah. What was it? It was a uh, Harmony, and my dad bought it for me out of a pawn store for, I think it cost $16. And it was an acoustic, and I remember I actually went out and bought a phonograph cartridge after about a, playing it about a month, and I hooked up a wire to it and ran it into this little miniature radio I had, an electronic guy at, at high school I was going to showed me how to do it, and that was my amplifier. <laughs> that was actually my first electric guitar. Did you have any formal guitar training at that age? Uh, no. No, I actually played for quite a number of years before I actually took a first lesson from some guy just to like, uh, I wanted to get some lessons at one time in like reading notes. So I took lessons for a while, but as far as my normal playing, all the stuff that I do, uh, I'm pretty much self-taught. Just going through your younger years there, playing uh, in the blues clubs of Chicago, it must have been an exciting environment uh, for you to be in. Could you tell us a little bit about that time? much in the what they call the downtown area of Chicago <clears throat> where they had all the uh, Twist City nightclubs and all that kind of stuff and or the Twist the Twist uh, the Peppermint Lounge and all these kind of places were going pretty strong then and then I got hooked up with this black bass player and he took me out to this place called Twist City and that's where all the major blues guys in Chicago would play like every week they'd have major stars there B.B. King Howlin' Wolf Mighty Waters and I started playing there every week with this guy, and I used to have jams all the time once a week, and, and I got my own little band in there playing once in a while, and that was kind of like my blues training. I was right there with the real guys, and I learned firsthand. Looking back now, what do you think would be the most valuable thing you learned from playing around those guys? Just the, the style of blues, a whole technique of, you know, like bending. I used to watch Buddy Guy a lot like bending strings and playing vibrato it's just kind of a whole style of music for sure that was you know the forefront of what was happening at that day and definitely a major part of my music cool. one of your early jobs was with uh, Charlie Musselwhite as far back as that time did you have ambitions to, to perhaps venture out and, and make a name for yourself as an artist as well well when I started playing with Charlie neither of us were known we both were just playing in Chicago, and in fact, we both went out together at the same time to San Francisco, and that's where we both, after playing out here for a while, we did a job, a couple jobs at the Fillmore and the Avalon, and it was called the Southside Sound System with Charlie Musselwhite and myself, and uh, I guess we did a few jobs and a few things, and at that point, when we were out here, we kind of branched out. I went off my direction and got a record deal with Mercury, and he went off and did all the stuff that he's been doing for years and that's pretty much how it started. When did you feel that you really became aware of the guitar sound and direction that uh, you were looking for personally? Well, it just kind of happened. I don't think he even realized that I just started playing and after a while you just start, I just started naturally going towards the direction that I've been in for years and it wasn't really a planned thing. It just kind of happened just based on, you know, my background and the style of music that I started playing on and stuff. The uh, snake nickname, where'd that come from? Sorry? The snake nickname, where did that uh, originate? Uh, Barry Goldberg, another uh, good musician from Chicago that grew up. He also played with us with Charlie Musselwhite. He, uh, I used to walk around with this weird little leather jacket and it looked like snake skin to him and that's where he called me the snake and then he said my fingers look like little snakes going up and down on the fingerboard <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you recount the story to us as, uh, as to how you became uh, a member of Can't Hate I was living in San Francisco at the time and I remember I had just recorded about two or three of my solo albums and I was just starting to get pretty well known there out in California area especially and I just happened to be at the Fillmore one night by pure accident I didn't even know Ken Heat was playing and all of a sudden uh, some girl runs up to me and says the bear wants you in the back he 
quick. They either can't heat once hockey in the back there. So I go back in the dressing room and meet all the guys and everything, and we're all sitting around smoking a couple. And next thing I know, I hear the story that uh, Larry Taylor and Henry Vestine got into a giant fight, Henry Vestine being the guitar player, and he got fired and had a big argument and walked off, and that was the end of him for that moment. And they were sitting here with no guitarist. So they asked me to sit in, and it was the second set I sat in. It sounded great, even unrehearsed, and I left with them that night. They offered me the job, and I left with them that night. Two or three days later, we ended up playing at Woodstock. <clears throat> so I got in at a very good moment. How vivid are your memories of playing with I Can't Hate at Woodstock? Well, when I look at the movie, I remember more. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a blur but when, every time I see the some footage from the Woodstock movie then it kind of comes back yeah were you aware at the time what a what a significant event it was going to be or it was probably something that uh, came Not to you really for me it was significant just to be playing yeah with a major band from being from absolutely you know ground zero and all of a sudden overnight I'm playing with a band that had hit records and was making giant money and playing all over the place so that was pretty significant right there. I didn't even comprehend the significance of Woodstock at the time. Do you think we really got to hear the best from uh, that particular lineup of Can't Hate? Do you think uh, Al Wilson in particular may have still had his best work ahead of him? Yeah, for sure. Yeah? They are all just little kids there. What were the circumstances surrounding you leaving the band? Uh, we were, I was with him for about a year. At the end of the year, Wilson kind of had the idea that he wanted to play with Dustin again because they were real buddies that grew up for years. And then me and Larry Taylor had an offer to go with John May also. We kind of just coincided the whole thing at once. Dustin came back with Can He, and me and Larry Taylor split and left and went on tour with John May. How did that offer from, from John May come about? He just knew us from touring, you know, we did lots of shows together and he saw me play and he saw Larry play and uh, he just put the word out and got a hold of us and uh, that was it. Now that wasn't uh, an extremely long association either. Were you feeling a need at this time to, to move on and perhaps do more of your own thing? Yeah, well I, I stay with Mel, same thing like Can He for about a year. And then at that point, I went off and did my own thing with Sugar Cane Harris, Pure Food and Drug Act and stuff. Now, is that correct at one stage you auditioned to be Mick Taylor's replacement in the Stones? Well, I didn't really audition. They just invited me to come down to Germany to play on the record among three or four other guitarists. And then out of all the guitarists, including Ron Wood, that's how they were going to pick who was going to go on tour with them next. He ended up getting the gig as far as going on tour, but I still got to play on the record, two cuts. Now you've played with a wide variety of artists over the years, of various musical styles as well. How important do you regard that now in terms of your growth as a musician to, to play in those various styles? Well, that's, I consider myself a, you know, a real well-rounded musician in that sense. I'm not really stuck in just one thing. I play blues, I play rock, I play jazz up to a certain point. I'm not like a traditional jazz guitarist, but I'm a more modern style jazz. And, uh, and psychedelic, you know, and even uh, funk and techno a little bit. So really, I mean, all those styles are all part of my playing. Right. And you do consider that important to, to maintain that diversity? I mean, you, you do go out of your way to well, seek it? I don't even think about it. It just, it just happens. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Just reading through your bio, there, there's so many special on-stage performances that you've been involved with over the year with, with, with wonderful people. If you had to single out one particular performance as one you'll never forget the night of your life, so to speak, what, what would it be? Yeah, a bit of pressure on you there. I've had. That's the great thing about being a musician is you have a million of those kind of nights. Yeah. Or happening. It's not like most people in their lifetime, if they have one magic moment in their life, they're thrilled. I've probably had 200 magic moments in my life of great, you know, musical things and being on stage and playing with different people. So it's 
it's really hard to pinpoint it. I want to pinpoint, yeah. Other than probably playing with the Stones in the studio is kind of a musical highlight. You're often seen as an innovator on the guitar not, and not a copier of other people's styles. I gather that's also important for you to, to always remain looking ahead. Well, in a way, like I say, it's never been planned. It just kind of worked out that way. And I'm always striving to play new and different things. And most of the time it's original and, and I have come up with a lot of different stuff first. And I purposely try not to copy, you know, other happening guitarists where I'm going to go play like Jimi Hendrix note for note or Eric Clapton note for note. I would never do that. But yet I'll still listen to all the cool guys and be influenced by their styles and licks and stuff. But I'm not going to copy like it's one guy where you could listen and say, oh, well, that's a, you know, that lick. Anytime you hear a lick, it's a Harvey Mandel lick. Yeah. Like I, I'd rather be known for that. Very true. Uh, one area where you're you're noted as a pioneer is the uh, the two-handed fretboard tapping technique. Do you recall the inspiration for you to adopt that? Well, I was playing with the uh, Pure Food and Drug Act and the second guitarist, this guy Randy Resnick. I actually saw him do it first. And he's the first guy I ever saw do it. And he did it in kind of a simple way. And I just took off what he did and just took it off a little further and went a little more Van Halen-ish like. And then in later years, after I started doing it a few years, Van Halen actually came in before he was ever big and saw me doing it at the Whiskey in L.A. And that's where he picked it up from. Unfortunately, he got to do it on a hit record and play on a video in front of 9 million people. So he... He gets the credit. kind of got the credit for doing it, even though Randy Resnick and myself were doing it four or five years before Van Halen ever even heard of that stuff. Now, a lot of your old albums have uh, recently found re-release on, on CD. You must be happy with that. Oh, yeah. Are you pleased with the way they came up? Yeah, because it's good to have a giant catalogue of stuff, and I have so many records out now. It was kind of fun to have them all pop out on CD instead of just on vinyl. It's nice to have it all in a CD collection, though. Now, I believe not too long ago you made an, an acting debut. Um, there was a movie here called Shock, and I had a little weird part in there. And they did some of my music for the background, three or four songs during the movie. And uh, how did you enjoy that experience? That yeah, was fun. Something you'd like to... froze my butt off on a beach. <laughs> I seen was I was like a surfer coming out of the water with this rubber suit on, and it was like freezing outside here. <laughs> when we filmed that, I remember. Is that a field you'd like to uh, look into a little bit further? Or just a one-off? Uh, never really thought about it. But if the situation ever arose and I could do it, some type of little cameo part or here and there, I certainly wouldn't turn it down. Now, talk about what you're up to these days. You formed a uh, production company, uh, Electric Snake Productions? Yeah, I have a, we have a nice little corporation based out of Colorado. Most of the business guys, and then I'm here, of course, in San Francisco. And uh, we did one project, Planetary Warrior, which uh, came out pretty good, unfortunately. It didn't get distributed around real good. But uh, I'm working on a new thing right now. It's kind of like a techno snake thing, and it's coming out extraordinary. And I got some like really innovative killer guitar stuff in here, much different than anything I've ever put on record. Now, tell us a bit about some of the players in your uh, current band, Electric Snake Band. Uh, it varies because I use different people for different things. Like the basic unit is is uh, guitar, bass, and drums, and a singer. And I'm using a local guy here on bass. Diz, Dismar is his name. Fine bass player. And uh, I've been using this. Uh, other drummer, fine black musician named uh, Benny Murray. He played on the Planetary Warrior. And uh, my singer, Sonny Reese, who's also singing on uh, my current new project. And then I use different local people for other things if the situation arises, if I need a horn for some reason, or a piano, or this or that. I have my different guys I go to. 
And what would be the extent of your uh, live work these days? How much of the year would you spend um, touring around? Um, not real. I haven't been doing too much live stuff recently here because I've been mainly working on this project. And hopefully when that gets done and, and released, then I'll probably try to start going back on tour again. If the uh, right offer down under came along, would you consider an Australian visit? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been there a few times. The only thing I dislike about it is the plane ride. <laughs> it's just too damn long. It drives me nuts. It's a long trip, isn't it? I hate being locked up in an airplane for 24 hours. Aside from that, I love Australia. Yeah. Just to finish up, Harvey, um, advice for uh, budding young guitarists. If uh, you had spent five minutes with a young guitarist and just had time to give him one piece of advice, what, what do you think it would be? Well, especially today, the competition is so extraordinary. Even when I started playing, there was only a fraction of the guitar players there are now. And there's so many good copiers. It's very, there's very few original guys. I would say the, the key to becoming something special these days is to strive to be original. Play your own thing, be influenced by other people, but don't try to copy note for note. Like, use other people as a learning tool and try to go off and do your own thing, and then if it's meant to happen, it will. I certainly, and it did for you. Okay, well, I thank you for your time. Uh, this morning's right. been, been a treat talking to you. Thanks for all the wonderful music over the years. All Best right. of luck with the new project, and uh, we look forward to uh, checking it out. Stay in touch, and uh, when it's ready, I'll have Dave send you a copy. That'll be fantastic. Thanks, Harvey. All righty.